Um, I hope you had a nice lunch break. Welcome back. Um, so we're going to start the afternoon session of this symposium um, with first a uh, talk um, by Fabian Schoenaich. Um, and uh, then Corey Archangel will join us on Zoom because as Bettina mentioned this morning, uh, he was a bit sick and so wasn't able to attend in person. Uh, and he will join us for a lecture performance uh, online. And, uh, and then we will um, end on a panel discussion uh, with all of the participants, or all of the, um, the contributors to the symposium, uh, moderated by Bettina Steinburger. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, Fabian. Uh, Fabian Schönesch is uh, the founder and director of CCA Berlin. He was previously curator at Porticus in Frankfurt, where he realized numerous solo and group exhibitions with artists such as Minu Klim, Otto Bungan Konga, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, or Amy Silman. He also curated the 2013 and 2014 editions of the Listed Art Fair Basel Performance Project, featuring notably Adam Linder, Michael Dean, and him of Lydia Lewis, among others. Uh, Fabian Schoenaich is uh, also the, the editor of numerous publications and monographs. So I leave the floor to you, Fabian. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here and um, listening to amazing contributions. So um, I might repeat a few things, but I'm hopefully adding a few other thoughts to the discussion around Macerus. Um, you can't drink milk all the time, it turns sour sometimes too. It's a quote that comes, as we heard already, um, from, a, from a notebook of Mangerus that was published, a notebook series of, from 1995. It says, all paintings have to be painted anew. When I say all paintings, then I mean all those paintings we know and we no longer want to see because they've had their day. You can't drink milk all the time, it turns sour sometimes too, and because all painting is derived from influences of nature anyway, the natural process of renewal is inevitably at work here as well. It's all about inventing the invented. The violence of abstraction makes repeating unavoidable. Michel Mangeros was an artist of the present, super young, super successful, super fast, super colorful, super different, super in many respects, but times change, and so does the look at the work of a painter like Mangeros. The question of the symposium itself, what looks good today may not look good tomorrow, is basically the core of the whole discussion around Mangeros' practice. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the work of a painter who was born and raised in Luxembourg, studied in Stuttgart, lived in Berlin, in the literal meaning of the word, and in the end died much too early and tragically on his way to Luxembourg. A perfect circle, one could say. In a very short but intense career, Macheros created a considerable body of work and was equally lucky. Lucky in the sense of the people he met, who were defining for his career, and still are today. Also the exhibitions which he could realize must be highlighted. His first solo exhibition took place in 1992 at the Galerie Zellermeyer in Berlin. Only four years later in 1996, he had his first major institutional solo exhibition at Kunsthalle Basel, um, which is a template for the current exhibition at uh, Berlin's KW Institute for Contemporary Arts, which just opened recently. On the left-hand side, you see the Kunsthalle Basel. Um, installation view on the right hand side, an image from last Sunday's, um, my personal gallery we visit to see the show. The floor is taken over by the Kunsthalle. There's different elements in the show that brings together early works as such, but it's quite nice to see both of these installation views together because it also probably is an interesting starting point for later to discuss how the work itself was not only shown again, but like very much restaged as it was shown um, while he was alive. 
The symposium is dedicated to him and his work, and I will try to focus on how he worked and especially how he per uh, perceived his environment um, and translated it into an artistic practice. In doing so, I will propose to look at his work not only from an art historical perspective, but rather to emphasize the social and political qualities of his work. The work we're dealing with today is, as I said, extensive and yet limited. Perhaps that's why it's so powerful. We look at these paintings and installations and think, wow, they describe what characterized the 90s. Techno, super graphics, computer games, and Berlin on the rise after reunification. All of Europe seemed to look at Berlin as the new capital, particularly for art. In Germany, it was formerly Cologne, but suddenly Berlin became a, the capital for new exciting art, ideas, and music. It was out with the old and in with the new, and Macheros was an example of this, said Daniel Birnbaum in an earlier interview. The city itself was a blank canvas, the possibilities endless, and yet our perspective on that time has changed. So what were the 90s? Were they indeed formative, or was it a brief period of liberation that was really about nothing at all? A moment of relaxation, just having fun, Yes, and certainly in Berlin. This freedom runs through the work like a thread. Majero tried things out, walked around Berlin, was inspired by just about everything. The sampling, which you always read about when discussing the artist's techniques, may come from that. He brings it all together, mixing art history with popular culture. Majerus did not necessarily criticize the painting that, became, uh, that came before him. Rather, he used it and put together what he needed. That way he didn't have to reinvent what was already there. He had a great fondness of 20th century painting, which was reflected in references to numerous and to be emphasized here exclusively male artists, including Andy Warhol, Frank Stella, Gerhard Richter, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Julian Schnabel, Mark Rothko, Sigmar Polke, Willem de Koning, Antis Mentes, Kossuth, and Sonderberg. Let's look at OT collaborations number eight here in the background. The General Electric logo already existed. He used it and combined it with motifs from the joint works of Warhol and Basquiat. Motifs that already existed as well. Mix and match what belongs together, according to the artist. Macheros was not a painter who celebrated the classical artistic suffering in order to create the painting. Rather, he enjoyed life and transferred his liveliness to the surface of the picture, but also into the space. The canvas was not a boundary, but only one of many levels. The space, whether it was the exhibition space or the city itself, another. Friedrich Mesche, the former director of the Kunsthalle Bielefeld, describes his as Bilderstürmerisch. You have to destroy something to create something new. And Daniel Birnbaum elaborates, Majerus quoted the history of painting in its entirety, but he never moralized or indulged in melancholy reflections on the loss of authenticity. Instead, his work celebrated the profusion of images to which the history of art has given rise. The temporality of his work, I claimed and still do, is that of a floating, all-encompassing now, perhaps analogous to that of the internet. This being situated in the now, which Daniel Birnbaum speaks of here, becomes more and more relevant in the artist's work. And the more relevant it becomes, the more I think the reading of his early exhibition changes. What I'm interested in here are two questions. On one hand, I'm thinking about why his work so precisely reflects his time and is therefore still relevant today. The other question is whether his work is political. I think both questions are very close to each other. As I said, in the 1990s, for a large part of the younger generation, it was about having fun. Of course, there was political protest and social change, but especially in Berlin, that should play a smaller role for a moment. To claim that today's time is more serious sounds out of touch. Nevertheless, we look at many things differently today, or more consciously. We know that the art history we learned exclusively reflected a Western discourse. We not only think about equality, but act actively try to implement it consistently. Although it is absurd that we are still trying and that it has not simply become a reality long ago. The world and its societies are more interconnected and yet there is a global unease. The gap between rich and poor is widening very quickly. 
and right-wing populism is making it its way into many cabinets. And it is war. It actually began a year before Majero's death with the war in Afghanistan, then the Iraq war, which also contributed to political life in Europe. And since the beginning of the year, we live with the immediate consequences of the Russian war of aggression on Ukraine and the role of art. We continue to question it and try to develop a social discourse in parallel. At least we know that the museum should not only collect and preserve, but also bring people together, like today. Back to Majerus. Looking at his work, it's primarily form and color that jump out, but if we concentrate on what we see, we realize that Majerus didn't just use whatever he found, but he had a great talent to perceive very, very precisely his environment with a very clear focus on the youth culture of this time. Donkey Kong, Super Mario, and other characters from popular video games, manga characters, sneakers, videotapes, corporate logos, and brands. We all see these symbols today and know exactly what is meant. They are icons of what was the religion of the time. At first, I wondered how an artist like him would have worked in today's modern times. Would augmented or virtual reality have been his medium? Would his work have shifted more and more into digital space and would NFTs have become his image carriers? Is it possible that Macheros would have collaborated with Balenciaga? Possibly. Or maybe he would have just kept painting. It doesn't matter to think about these what ifs. Rather, it should be about applying his approach to today and not just repeating what was then, but translating him and his work into a new context. The idea of the symposium is also for people to engage with Macheros who previously had no direct connection to him and his work. One of these people is me, who had no direct connection. I was therefore all the more pleased about the invitation to engage with, and this engagement made me all the more curious to learn more. My interest in contemporary art is always also an interest in how art can be seen and understood in a social and political context. It is important to me that, does, that it does not have to be understood and that the non-understanding is essential. So the question I ask myself is whether his work has this political level. I think there's an interesting shift in the work, or maybe shift is the wrong word. Rather, in his short career, works emerge here and there that deal more decisively with the political realities of this time. If we remember what um, Sarah mentioned earlier in the talk, I think this idea of rhythm is super interesting because if you would look at this very short career of Majerus as such, there is a very kind of like, let's say, enthusiastic rhythm in the beginning of his career where he produces a lot of work and is kind of very kind of like motivated and inspired by being in Berlin. And then there comes this kind of like breakthrough with big exhibitions all over the place and this rhythm accelerates to a very kind of like fast pace, um, almost close to a heart attack, I would imagine. And then suddenly I think there's this shift. Um, and the shift is kind of like, for me, the Sozial Palace, where I'll talk about later, but the shift is when the rhythm changes back to a very kind of like solid, but extremely loud and precise, slow rhythm of very specific statements. Thank you for that inspiring <laughs> idea that I just used. Um, Celebration Generation from 1994 is a very peculiar interweaving of a personal, obviously racist listing of the apparent political goals of the major German parties from the perspective of an anonymous K. Alba from Berlin Mitte. <laughs> to read about it, it says, Wizard of the Sonic Celebration Generation, Rave and Somewhere Over the Rainbow, it takes me away. Go ahead. The first two lines are album names of Westbam, a German DJ. The last three lines are song titles from the album Raveland from 1994 by the German Greek DJ Marusha. An entanglement of two realities, but perhaps also the beginning of a parallel view of Macheros at this time. The quotations that overlay the surface come from a parallel world, just as this listing itself comes from a separate world. There are two respective clashes in the same society. Both have nothing to do with each other, and yet they are to be found in the same time and place in Berlin. Let's go back to 
living in the now that Daniel Burma talked about it, and look at the exhibition Gemälde, his first gallery show with Neuke Riemschneider in Berlin 1994, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, a one-to-one -one restage of the very same exhibition that opened in the now much bigger gallery space of Neuke Riemschneider in Berlin last Sunday. A complete takeover of the small exhibition space with paintings on all walls, drawings, prints, paintings above. The floor covered with a thick layer of asphalt. Macheros here not only brought the street into the gallery, but translated one-on-one -on -one what he saw. It may seem cool and different, but it's basically the political reality of a youth that moved through the city and became more and more visual. And instead of taking his art outside, he took it inside. He did it later again in 2000 at the Kölnischer Kunstverein by building a skate ramp inside. If we are dead, so it is. Just also, I know, know if you actually realized, um, obviously, it, I think personally, it's a very cool move to bring this half pipe into the gallery space of Kölnischer Kunstverein, but then for everyone who actually does skateboard, it's a very infunctional ramp because there's no headspace. So you couldn't really use it. It was only later in two occasions where it was reinstalled again in a public space that um, it was a fully functional skateboard ramp. It's almost like a skateboard ramp built by a nerd who likes the aesthetic of skateboarding into the arts. With these installations, people often talk about how he brought the aesthetics of the outdoor space in to the indoor space. Perhaps today we should also talk more about how he brought the issues of the street into art. He was a critic of his time. I think the peak of his political constant in his work was reached in 2002, when he was able to realize his Sozialpalast. While the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin was being renovated and roofed over for this purpose, there was a moment when Macherus could occupy this place. He had a photograph, as you heard, of a building in Berlin-Schöneberg, the Palaceum, printed on tarpaulin, a block of flats that was also called a social hotspot. Um, the Berlin Morgenpost, one of the kind of more gossipy Berlin newspapers wrote, with a spectacular art action, Bewerk, the city's electricity company, has now moved the Schöneberg Sozialpalast of all places right into the good parlor of Berlin. The spokesman for the energy company says, but the less beautiful sides of Berlin are also part of this city. The artwork forces visitors to stop and think about it. Klaus Wolf from Rudo, a part of Berlin, also thinks it's good to show what it's still like here in Berlin, and he adds, day over there, he nods toward the Adlon Hotel, a luxury hotel next to the gate, should think about how the people in the social palace have to live. The retired policeman used to work there himself and not knows what he's talking about. Daniel Birnbaum, the creator of the project, sums it up by saying that the piece he did for Berlin rather was a huge political statement about multiculturalism. Unemployment, how the government spends its money, what's to be remembered culturally, what's to be taken away, and also, this remains important in Germany, what deserves to be rebuilt. The most important element in discussing the extent to which Macero's work was politically informed is time. In principle, the only real factor of it all. Time matters not only because he lived and worked for a short time, but because his work was set in his time. The imagery of his environment is fast, and so at any moment it could happen that the ground slips from under his feet. References to the most up-to-date visual motives may look good in the moment, but there's danger that they will all age too quickly together and then simply fall out of circulation, meaning that they will look old. Macheros knew that. A number of his paintings and large in installations call out to the viewers, as the symposium suggests, what looks good today may not look good tomorrow, writes Stefan Heidenreich in the catalog of the exhibition Everything Appears More Serious in the USA at Kunsthalle Bielefeld. Macheros does no New knows that his use of brands, logos, and comic references must be well thought out and that they must not appear at some point to be meaningless or out of time. The work must remain timeless, the references in the sense neutral. This neutrality within his radical visual language is an attitude, the attitude of an observer. Heidenreich also writes about the fact that Sozialpalast takes references to social and political representational conditions like no other work. <coughs> 
the work does not really change, but a different strategy is used. The user plays a greater role, while in other works those figures were represented that were consumed, Teletubbies, or controlled, Super Mario, by the user, now it is about the user himself. Already in If We Are Dead, So It Is, the skateboard ramp in Cologne, he came into play in the figure of the skater. Now it's about real people and the so not beautiful reality of their lives. What is different today? The subcultures that informed Macheros back then have disappeared or dissolved into the respective brand worlds. Computer games are no longer just for nerds, but form an enormous billion dollar market served by millions of users. Comics and mangas continue to exist. Cosplay is now more visible in Europe. Skateboarding is still on the streets and perhaps the closest thing to an independent subculture. Refusing to be luxury. While sneaker, still cool, has become an important element of the luxury industry itself. I think luxury plays a major role as it attempts to simulate the artist's practice in today's world. In recent years, there has been a huge shift in the number of buyers, and so the strategy of the luxury industry have changed and adapted. At the same time, even though fashion has always been inspired by art, it is being incorporated more and more. The luxury industry knows how to use art to legitimize itself. The cultural potential masks the capitalist core. Even today, there are artists who in a striking way reflect what makes up our society or dominates today's youth. Practices that go beyond a discourse conducted solely in art. Anne Imhoff is certainly one of them as she simulated an image of youth that is incredibly close to reality. And then the fashion industry came and long and swallowed it. There's the French artist Mohamed Bourou Issa, whose photographs and videos take a critical look at the image in the mass media and show people who are left behind at the interface between integration and exclusion. Or Takeshi Murakami, whose work can be reminded of Macheros in form of color and within which he uses characters from Japanese anime, images from the post-World War II era and the Japanese art history. However, it took him a while to get on the same level um, like Macheros. There are more, of course. You can't drink milk all the time. It turns sour sometimes too. Macheros wrote in his notes in 1995, calling for all paintings to be painted in you. You actually should all get this book. Um, probably the estate sends it to the universities you're coming from. Um, it's kind of essential because it changes the way you look at his work while reading his very kind of like short and precise thoughts about it. The fact that milk goes bad once does not mean that you will never drink milk again. Everything has an expiration date. Macheros was an innovator who was aware of his time but didn't get stuck. Perhaps he would have continued as he was. He would have made art that was neutral in some ways but also precise, aggressive and loud that brought the street into the gallery and art into the outer space. However, his work should be looked at not only from an art historical perspective, but also from a social critical one. In doing so, his strategy should be elaborated because that is what is timeless and from which we can still learn so much today. Namely, not only to recognize the necessity in the art of a time, but to implement it again and again, to paint the pictures anew and those to leave the old pictures their own space. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. Um, I really appreciated that in your talk you um, link Majerus to uh, the wider context of where he lived in, so like the city of Berlin, and uh, also the context of the city of Berlin after the fall of the wall, with like uh, this kind of bursting of new art and new ideas that was probably allowed by all these available space, and like so it felt like. Uh, full of possibilities and um, so you just uh, opened a new space in Berlin which uh, as we uh, saw earlier is uh, a city that is, that is changing at the moment and kind of like taking like tuning in with neo neoliberalism I guess um, with like much much more competition uh, in the art scene uh, higher rents like all of that 
Um, so I was wondering um, how, what are the, um, what is at stake um, basically in like opening a new space, uh, a new art space, a new art institution in Berlin at the moment compared to uh, maybe the time Majerus was active? Um, I think, I mean like obviously the city has changed tremendously since he was living in Berlin. Um, and there was this enthusiasm of, of a lot of like artists, but also gallerists, collectors coming to this time, like engaging with the, with the city. Um, maybe not so much engaging, just using it because there was suddenly so much space available, like this, this blank canvas ref reference. Um, but then it's also interesting that like this kind of over the saturation or like the discussion around Berlin not so much then actually happened in the past 30 years in like proper, I don't know, developing of an artistic communities. There's a lot of artists living in the city that have amazing studios, but they show internationally. There's a lot of great galleries in the city that somehow have their own communities, but they're mainly also visible internationally. So I think what, what I'm interested in is something that I would probably assume of Macheros. What I try to say is that at a certain point, his work became much more precise in terms of looking at his actually social and political surrounding. Like in the beginning, he looks at brands, he looks at surfaces, he looks at graffiti, he says, sees an LED sign in a, in a kiosk and he's inspired and he uses it and he knows how to kind of like use all these elements to also outdate all the existing male painters that were there before him. But then, with the ramp, there was still this kind of like street style in his work, but then with the Social Palace, suddenly there is this actual reality that is not only the surface. It might be a surface as it's a print, but like there is suddenly it's about people. The, it's about like a huge division of poor and rich. It's about this kind of like idea of Berlin as a divided city that is still somehow divided. Thank you. Uh, any question from the audience? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fabian, for uh, this uh, great uh, lecture. Um, I'm wondering how you connect this uh, very particular reactivation of the exhibition spaces, or that the exhibitions of Mayeros, both at the Bundes, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> Kunsthalle Basel. And um, and KW, oops, um, and then yes. uh, Neuer Schneider in the nineties and now. So, is there in this uh, in this choice a social political uh, aspect that is translated into that uh, reenactment that you see? Because it's interesting that um, that the the pieces that you showed today, um, also part of the, uh, the exhibitions in Berlin, are commenting directly to a social political reality. Mm. Uh, that it's still, um, it's still not obsolete, uh, the, the crises back then are still not obsolete, like migration mm. crisis, uh, economic crisis. Um, so it's interesting to see that uh, by Reactivating the spaces, we have two different space uh, time. So I don't want to answer this for you. Um, excuse me. This was a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, good question. I mean, I yeah. I th obviously. Um, 20 years have passed since Macheros passed away. Um, there is a completely different discourse today, uh, probably also a completely different awareness of how you would look at works. Um, there is, this exhibition happened in the gallery and I think like even like if you only would focus now on a purely art world discourse or art historical perspective, it's already interesting that an exhibition like that at Neugeriem Schneider, 1994, um, young, naive gallerists invite a young, naive painter 
to open a show in a 15 square meter space and it becomes such a relevant piece compared to today where Young Gallery opens usually a 200 square meter space and is immediately visible in New York, London, Tokyo and Paris for instance. I think already like within the art world there's a shift because back then it was much more about I would say and if you would go through like art history books about specific necessities and qualities of practice and trusting a work and trusting in an artist and not mu only about representation of the institution of a gallery or an actual institution. So this is interesting on one hand side, but then also obviously today the discourse has changed. That's why today this discussion must have, must have, um, must take place. Like looking at this work and, and think about it, like it's not only cool that he brought asphalt into the gallery space, but it also means something. And why does it mean something? What does asphalt mean as a connotation, as a symbol of like a youth culture, but also of a social reality? So I think that like artworks in general are discussed more broadly in social and political terms is a development that wasn't so present back then, but now it is. So I think this shift should happen. Um, specifically with such exhibitions like that. On one hand side, I also find it problematic to continuously like restage the shows like they were. It's also not the sec first time it was already once set up like that in Graz, I think. Um, for me, it's beautiful because I like to see it, how it was, and especially now to see like the small gallery space within the big gallery space is also an interesting, like time travel back to the future would be a good Maggio also reference. <laughs> yeah, hope that answers. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I don't know how much you already answered the question I'm gonna ask because I don't really understand English that good but um, I feel like today when you are a young artist it's uh, like touchy to don't, to don't talk, don't show, don't represent uh, social problems and uh, political issues and stuff like that and uh, I want and like uh, draw Mario or uh, TV reality shows or stuff like that. And I wanted to know if uh, uh, Michel uh, Magerus had the same uh, questions and if he was uh, criticized cri sometimes or if it was new. So so nobody had nothing to say about uh, how he used uh, his tal talent. His what? His uh, skills. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mean if like w the, t the first part I didn't quite understand. Today as a young artist, it is necessary or not, or like <laughs> to be Socially aware. Wait. It seems uh, like uh, not okay to just just talk about uh, silly stuff like uh, TV shows and. Oh yeah. And okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I know what you mean. I wouldn't agree um, necessarily, but like it's it's. I mean, if you if you if you read about Majerus and you look into his practice, and this you can do with many other artists somehow, he's a bit special in that regard. He was a complete nerd. He was only working. Uh, it was almost like an autistic approach. We just talked about it with um, Tim, his his gallerist. Um, he had this almost like a mania. He only went like he walked through the city. He saw everything. Like I don't know using a digital camera until the, the memory card is full and then he disappeared to the studio and he painted everything he saw until he f slept. And then his friends went to a rave, he joined them, but he slept on the sofa because he wanted to be awake when to go back to the studio. There's other artists, like I think Christopher Rule wrote about him that 
when he had to travel at six in the morning, he spent the night in the studio painting because he liked to look at new works when he returned from his travel. So he was only producing in a, in a very strange, but also fascinating way, obviously. Um, and this doesn't really have changed today, I think, the appreciation of such a practice that developed such a specific necessity. I mean, he dealt with something so specific to his time. Obviously, dealing with Super Mario today is somehow outdated, um, except of maybe bringing it in relation to queer studies, um, to kind of like make a relation to the history of, of computer games in that sense. But I think it's about like, understanding how he perceived his environment and how he translated this perception, because that's mainly the thing. It's not about Donkey Kong or kind of cool sneakers, really. It's much more about a kind of like, and that's always social politically interesting. You don't have to be a political artist, a protester to be political artists. Making no political statement is a political statement. So every art as such is already political because art is always the first thing that disappears in a dictatorship. So it's the, the kind of like most extreme form of freedom and liberation somehow. And then it's about like finding this, I guess, very specific narrow angle, but like, I guess there's no recipe. Thank you. There is another question. Hello, uh, thank you for your thoughts and your speech. It was amazing, I really liked it. And um, yeah, I just wanted to add some things. Uh, as a, Yux a Luxembourgish artist, I'm 27 years old, finishing my master now in Basel. And um, so I just wanted to, to add something about the impact on Luxembourgish artists. So me as 27 year old, I didn't know Michel Moreros personally, but I, I think I know a bit about his work, even more today. And I just wanted to say that for, Luxem for Luxembourg, so a country where where life turns around uh, buying houses, cars, clothing, and investing money to get more of it. I think that I think that um, Michel Margeros, even though he he denied a bit his origin country, I think that he he reflected it a lot in his work. So he he worked with hypercapitalism, and and uh, yeah, the most important thing is he allowed Luxembourgish people or Luxembourgish artists to dream. He was the first one who was big in, in internationally speaking. He has he had his, uh, his work outside of Luxembourg. And it's something I think that a lot of young people uh, in Luxembourg dream about now. So I think that he's a very good example for a young Luxembourg, uh, for Luxembourgish artists and also young Luxembourgish artists who made it. And uh, then I wanted to talk about, or I want also to ask you why Michel Mogeros is still, is still um, important in the art world. And so my personal thoughts are that, uh, first of all, he, he worked with, with media that are still, still there now, and he had not the chance to be sellout. I say not the chance because of, of his death, of course. And, um, and yeah, so a lot of French uh, rappers say, uh, J'ai peur de mettre de faire l'album de trop. So the album that is too much. He didn't do this album that is too much. He was on his peak, or not even on his peak. And another thing that I wanted to say is that uh, you talked about uh, he placed Mario on his paintings, the Mario that is controlled by the player. So um, the Mario and the player has changed. So technology is kind of controlling human beings today with algorithms and things like that, social media. So the player becomes Mario, and I, I would have really liked to see Michel Mageros work today with social media because I think he would do a very good job. So I wanted to know why is Michel Mageros still important for, for you? Thank you. <laughs> um. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, there, I think in general there's not many artists that are like not alive anymore today that still have a relevance for a contemporary discourse, but then it also changes from time to time because times change. 
Um, and as I, as I tried maybe to say earlier, I think the relevance today is that on one hand side, I didn't, I think he wouldn't engage with social media today because it's not, social media today is not the same thing like Super Mario back then. Super Mario was a like subculture and a, a very kind of like visually dominant subculture. Social media is not a subculture. It's a way of manipulating public elections. It's a tool, it's a media outlet, it's a way of self-representation. It's like everything, it's so dominant. It's like not, I think, I'm not sure if he would specifically be interested in it. Um, a guess, super wild guess. Um, but I think the kind of like the way he, he kind of like managed to perceive little details in his surrounding that only also look now so absolutely kind of like uh, visible is, is the quality. Because also like imagine Berlin post reunification, it's not a colorful city. It's like gray, cold, mostly destroyed and unrenovated. There's no kind of like oat milk coffee shops. Um, it's a completely kind of like devastated city, but it was empty. So there was space to do something. And the space was sometimes filled with a television that showed MTV or Viva 2. So that's the way images were created. And then sometimes slowly you had neon signs, LED signs and so on. But before that, it wasn't really there. So back then it wasn't colorful, but his paintings are colorful. And I think there's an interesting shift or like also, um, division within. And the rest was more like a statement, no, not a question. I like the statement. <laughs> yeah. There's an interesting one thing more, like there's interest, uh, like if you would look into the work of Charlotte Posenenske, completely different practice, different style, different life. Um, she's also not alive anymore, maybe the only link, and they're both German, not, no, not. <laughs> <laughs> um, she stopped making art at a certain point uh, because she didn't believe that art can contribute to any social change. Um, that's why she stopped making it and then she died much too early. But her work, if you would look into it now, like the manifest she wrote, the performances she made, the way she dealt with serial production, aesthetics, surface, minimalism, it's so radical even in today's context of art production that it's still relevant, even though it's like almost 50 years old. Um, I had a question about the means of uh, his productions because he seems to have produced a lot of pieces and uh, some of them are very huge. And because of what you said about how he was working all the time, I was wondering if he had like a really big studio and uh, assistants, or he was really working alone and just uh, doing it all by himself. Uh, I don't know if you have. Maybe I have to say that I'm not a Michel Mayeros expert, um, but he had like, I mean, he had assistants. There's a documentation. I'm not sure if that's released <laughs> soon, soon. Um, he had assistants. He was very specific with colors. He, they mixed colors on very specific scales. He, the studio was big, but not huge. Um, yeah, like industrial style studio, working with stencils, colors, pencils, everything. Thank you. Thank you, Fabian. <laughs>